There were a lot of capitalist aspects of slavery in terms of like the operation of it as a business, but at its core, it was fundamentally organized around involuntary labor market transactions. And so trying to think about the implications of that and, and what it would imply for the sort of economic performance of the whole system and in terms of how much was it really delivering aggregate economic gains was something that I, I felt was important to, to revisit and to sort of recharacterize. The movie Gone with the Wind depicts a genteel, harmonious world torn apart as the old way of life comes to an end. Of course, behind that gentility was the inhumanity of slavery. And when slavery came to an end, it transformed the economy of the American South. Morally, that was a good thing. But contrary to the depiction in the movie, was it also positive for the economy? Welcome to the Chicago Booth Review podcast, where we bring you groundbreaking academic research in a clear and straightforward way. I'm Hal Weitzman, and in this episode, we're going to take a deep dive into one single research paper with one Chicago Booth researcher. Rick Hornbeck is an economic historian whose new research suggests that emancipation actually created huge economic value, a boost to the US economy that was even bigger than the introduction of the railroad. Hornbeck arrives at that conclusion by analyzing all the costs and all the benefits of slavery and emancipation, both to the enslaved and to slaveholders. I sat down with him to learn more. My name's uh, Rick Hornbeck, and I'm the uh, V. Dwayne Rath Professor of Economics at the Chicago Booth School of Business. Would you consider yourself an economic historian? Yeah, I think I've, I've come over time to sort of increasingly recognize myself as an economic historian. I, I went to graduate school in economics, and my sort of background is in economics. My training is in economics, but I think through being in graduate school and just through thinking about different economics questions, I often got drawn more toward a lot of things can be interesting sort of in the immediacy, but what we're often very interested in, how do these things play out over time? So like how do people become wealthier over long periods of time? How do people take advantage of different major opportunities or how do they mitigate different major challenges? And essentially like how has the world just become better off or in what ways has the world become better off over time? Uh, and so that sort of increasingly drew me to different historical topics. And I think after I had written or was writing several history papers or several economic history papers, I just sort of realized, like, oh, the common theme that connects a lot of the things that I'm interested in is economic history. You've done some new research on the economics of emancipation. What was your motivation for this project? This paper on slavery and emancipation is is really sort of a return to a literature that was a very big literature in the past, trying to understand, well, what was slavery? How do we characterize slavery? What are, what are its implications? Um, but I think something about that literature always made me somewhat uncomfortable, that I think it focused very much on kind of the operation of slavery as a, as a business and sort of enslavement as sort of a business enterprise, and then so somewhat inevitably from the perspective of enslavers and not really from like a more holistic sense of, well, there's an aggregate economy out there that includes enslavers, but also the enslaved. And they were treated like capital, in a sense, in slavery, but they were people at the end of the day. And, uh, and those people's perspectives and the costs they incurred is very much part of the aggregate economy. And so like, it, it felt very unsettling. I think the things that people, the, the, the focus, um, and so, I always felt like there was something that was missing or not emphasized enough. And so I think that was one thread. And another thread was just some of my other interests have been drifting toward thinking about misallocation in the economy and, and different inefficiencies in the economy and the implications of that for aggregate economic growth. And a lot of the work that I've been doing there has looked at ways in which sort of the economy is under providing certain goods or services. And if something happens, like say the rollout of the railroad network, that encourages more people, that encourages people to produce more, that's gonna have extra benefits if the economy is sort of under providing those goods otherwise. So you get this sort of bonus kick for economic growth if you do something that encourages economic activity that was being under provided. 
And then I was sort of thinking, well, is economic activity always underprovided? And so will things always have this like extra kick? Well, sometimes certain economic activities might be overprovided in the market. There might be too much of certain things. And then if we were to do something that decreases economic activity, that would be, that would be sort of particularly beneficial. And I think for me, the obvious example that just jumped out immediately is like, well, what was a thing that was overprovided? Well, labor under enslavement was dramatically overprovided. That sort of through coercion, enslavers were inducing enslaved people to work far beyond what anybody would sort of voluntarily in a wage system sort of choose or be compensated to work. And so that was a system where yeah, the inefficiency was that people were just being coerced and forced to work and work under conditions that were so intense, uh, much beyond what, what, what seemed like it could possibly be efficient. And so then emancipation, in a sense, brought that back. Emancipation sort of brought down labor inputs in the economy. It sort of it freed people to work less, in a sense. And with that came really phenomenal economic gains that I think had been underappreciated in the literature. How does your work fit into the broader economic literature on this topic? A lot has been written, and for a long time. I think back to the antebellum era, back to the era um, before the Civil War, uh, abolitionists and pro-slavery writers were talking about a lot of these issues and trying to characterize well, how, how productive is slavery, what would be the implications of emancipation, um, and so from then to, you know, shortly after emancipation, all the way up until now. And I think um, there was a resurgence of interest amongst economic historians in this, probably starting in the, well, starting somewhat in the 50s and 60s, but particularly, you know, the 60s and 70s um, with uh, Fogel and Engerman um, and the Nobel Prize in part in economic history was given to Fogel along with Doug North, but Fogel for... There's Robert Fogel, the University of Chicago and Booth economist. Yeah. Yeah. He wrote a lot on slavery, sort of characterizing sort of the economics of slavery. And I think in a sense, the business of slavery, sort of how, how it operated, you know, how much people ate, how much enslaved people ate, you know, how much they worked, how much they produced, sort of just, just kind of the data. But sort of reading through these these things and and thinking about them, there was always something that was that never seemed to quite hit the mark for me in terms of really getting at the heart of what enslavement was, sort of taking seriously this sense in which it was at its heart a, co a coercive institution and for you know was not fundamentally an a capitalist economic system in the sense that I think of sort of capitalist economic systems is fundamentally based on sort of voluntary exchange. And there were a lot of capitalist aspects of slavery in terms of like the operation of it as a business, but at its core, it was fundamentally organized around involuntary labor market transactions. And so w trying to think about the implications of that and, and what it would imply for the sort of economic performance of the whole system and in terms of how much was it really delivering aggregate economic gains was something that I, I felt was important to to revisit and to sort of recharacterize. I wanted something else that would sort of be like, okay, this is how we really should think about what slavery meant. And then by extension, what emancipation went. Because I think a lot of people have characterized the South as sort of going into economic decline after emancipation. You know, output fell in the South. This idea that of everything that was gone with the wind, you know, after emancipation, that, that something about the South had just had kind of evaporated in a sense, had, had left. And so it, it, it's been characterized often as, yes, the moral thing was done in abolishing slavery, but at, at, but at a cost, the cost of the Civil War, the cost of decreased output afterward, and it took the, and, and the South, uh, output in the South stayed low for a long period of time and eventually, you know, started to recover, you know, maybe 100 years later, it started to sort of increase substantially, maybe, you know, 100 years later. Um, and so, but I think there's a totally different characterization of what's happened in American history, which is that, yes, output went down, but it was a phenomenal increase in aggregate economic performance. When you think about the enslaved people as people really part of the economy and, and part of society. And so this wasn't sort of a decline in a sense, this was actually just a dramatic gain for the aggregate economy that, that we as a country you know, can, 
have been looking to build on and, and can continue to build on through through racial progress um, since and, and hopefully continued racial progress. And so, yeah, I think it just, I think I'm still myself trying to understand all of the different ways that sort of the characterization of slavery is so important to people uh, because I, and I think at its core, it's because it's just so foundational to what our country was and s before the Civil War and what the Civil War and emancipation meant just set the country on just a wholly new, better trajectory afterward and just opened up all these sort of potential gains subsequently. And so thinking about all of the gains that came about through emancipation, that's reflected you know, in, I think, the recent focus on, on for example, like Juneteenth as a holiday and what that means you know, I think still is sort of thought about as, well, it's a holiday for emancipated people. It's, it's a holiday for formerly enslaved people, or descendants of formerly enslaved people. And it was a tremendous, and it's a tremendous celebration of, of gains to them, but not just to them, to the aggregate country as a whole, because they're very much part of that aggregate country. And so that's why we're thinking about this as really a boost to sort of the aggregate performance of the overall US economy and, and sort of the, the, the country. Okay, and, and just since you mentioned Robert Fogel, who's the, of course, as I should also mention, was a Nobel laureate, right? Um, but am I right in remembering that Fogel's basic insight or basic premise was that while slavery was immoral, it was productive? Because previously, I think, I'm right in remembering that people had said slavery was sort of, the whole system was kind of an economic collapse, and he went through careful documentation to show actually it was very profitable for slave holders. Isn't that right? Yeah, I think some people had made that argument bef before him, but there certainly had been a characterization. Uh, one characterization of slavery um, is that it was this stagnant economic system that didn't really exist for economic purposes. It was more of a mechanism of social control. And actually, the 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 beginnings of that argument was actually in a lot of abolitionist writings prior to the Civil War, where abolitionists were arguing that, look, this, this system isn't even that great for the South, that um, you know, maybe, maybe everyone would be better off if, if slavery were abolished. Um, and you know, Adam Smith makes an argument that slavery is, is really not productive because uh, people that are working for somebody else, people that are coerced to work for somebody else, will never have that same incentive, will never have that same drive to produce that a free worker would. Um, and so that argument has been around for some time. And Fogel and, and others, I think, convincingly argue that, no, actually, co coercion can be very effective at inducing people to work much more than they would want to voluntarily. And it can induce a lot of output. One of the particularly controversial quantitative points that they made is they argued that enslaved people received 90% of what they were producing in the form of uh, food and shelter and clothing and, and different consumption goods. Um, and so Fogel and Angerman compare that provocatively to tax rates. And they say, well, look, a lot of people pay higher than 10% in taxes. Uh, and they're not considered to be, you know, uh, incredibly coerced. Uh, and so, so they, they sort of make that comparison. And one thing we argue in the paper is that it's really just the wrong focus, that it, the wrong thing to focus on is how much did enslaved people receive as a share of what they were producing, because what they were producing was in no way connected to the costs that they were incurring. The, the, really, the much better measure to focus on is sort of, well, what were enslaved people receiving as a share of the costs that they were incurring? And that's much lower. We calculate something more in the order of 7%. They were receiving maybe 7% of the costs that they're incurring. And slavers were receiving, were receiving about 7% as well in the form of um, just sort of surplus output that they were keeping and stealing in a sense. And then 86% of it was just completely lost. It was, it was just, it just evaporated in this extra cost that people were being forced to incur that they weren't actually even producing any output from. Um, and that's the sense in which we characterize slavery as, as, as not just theft, it's not just enslavers taking enslaved people's output from them through coercion. It's inefficient theft. That for every dollar that, that they're taking, they're losing a tremendous amount of that in, in the process. And that's the sense in which slavery is inefficient, is that it's, sort of, it's not just a transfer of wealth from one person who should rightfully have it to another. It's a transfer that loses a tremendous amount along the way.
Okay, I want to get into the model where you actually calculate. So you, your economic boost of emancipation that you calculate is somewhere between 4% of GDP and 35%. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Why, is it so, why is that such a wide range, and how did you arrive at that figure? So the actual calculations themselves is a very wide range because there's a very... There's, there's a wide range of costs of enslavement that, that, that someone could potentially consider. Um, because just it's not very well defined sort of at what price or at what, at what price would somebody voluntarily allow themselves to become enslaved is, is not a well-defined concept. Um, and so some of the smaller numbers reflect, you know, more limited calculations, things like, the premium that people were have that people might be paid after emancipation to work under that intense gang labor system, they were often offered a salary maybe two and a half times what the base typical salary would be, and and still they were often unwilling to work under that gang labor system. So if you think about okay, well, if that was the cost of enslavement, the fact that you know you wouldn't be if sort of a general agricultural income at the time per capita might be forty dollars. Uh, $100 would be the gang labor premium. And so if you think about the cost of enslavement to people were was $100 on that annual basis, and then you could do that calculation and you would find about, and, and that $100 exceeds the value that enslavers were actually receiving from uh, enslaved people. They were receiving more on the order of $60, maybe roughly $30, and this is a bit high perhaps, but let's say $30 went to enslaved people in the form of consumption and clothing and shelter and things like that. And then $30 was captured by the enslavers themselves. And that $30 was reflected in the market value of enslaved people, which was very substantial. If you have an asset that pays you $30 every year, that asset is going to have some substantial value. Um, and so $30 is going to enslavers, $30 is going to the enslaved. At sixty dollars, but a hundred dollars of cost is being incurred, and so forty dollars is being lost for every enslaved person. Forty dollars is being lost, and there were four million enslaved people, and so four million times forty dollars uh, is sort of the ag is the boost that the aggregate economy just recovers when it does away with this inefficient institution, uh, and that uh, that generates an aggregate economic gain that's worth the equivalent of around four percent of GDP. Um, so it, it generates the same boost that some new technological innovation would that would generate 4% of GDP. And, and that's it's an interesting number because it's actually in excess of some of Fogel's other calculations that calculate the aggregate economic gains from the entire railroad network and finds a number that's somewhat less than, than 4% of GDP. Um, so already with that small number, in a sense, uh, it's one of the more important technological innovations, in a sense, in U.S. history. But that number, that gang labor premium, is really far insufficient to capture all of the costs incurred under enslavement. There's just the loss of, of agency over time, over sort of where you're going to where you're gonna live, what, what you're going to do outside of you know, traditional so-called like working hours. People were not free to enjoy their lives as they might see fit. So how do you account for those bigger costs that slavery imposed? It, it's prohibitively difficult to think about going through all the different atrocities of enslavement and just assigning some cost to them, adding them all up, you know, the frequency of, of whippings and the fear of, of whippings um, was very salient. And it's very salient in narratives of formerly enslaved people as they're describing freedom and, and they're describing the cost of enslavement. It's very salient to them, but how do you even start to go about adding all of that up? And so a literature that we draw on there is a literature associated with uh, the value of statistical life. That while it's, while it's hard to think about the cost of enslavement, it's also similarly hard to think about the cost of, of death, in a sense. But we often have to think about the cost of death when we evaluate you know, what should speed limits be. We know if, if people are allowed to drive faster on highways, there will be more highway fatalities. But people get places faster, and so there's some trade-off. There, or you know, when we evaluate how much pollution is going to be allowed in the atmosphere, or what sort of what sort of levels of pollutants are going to be allowed, you know, elevated levels of pollution contribute to infant mortality, contribute to various respiratory problems, uh, elderly health issues. So 
the economy overall accepts some trade-off between economic value and, and death. Uh, and the, the language that economists sometimes use to think about that is, well, what trade-off is being made, they associate with this idea of value of a statistical life, that um, there's some economic value that's lost when people die and, and guides trade-offs that people themselves make when they think about whether to take on a riskier job versus a less risky job, when people decide you know, how fast they're going to drive, when people decide you know, various medical decisions. Uh, and so that value statistical life is hard to quantify, but is often sort of roughly some multiple of people's annual consumption or annual income, maybe 100 to 200 times annual income. Uh, and so, you know, for example, somebody then with, say it's 100 times, somebody with an annual income of, say, $60,000 a year, uh, it would be looking at, say, $6 million as sort of a trade-off of, okay, if so, somebody might be willing to accept, say, like a 1% chance of mortality in exchange for, you know, $60,000. Um, and th that everyone will have a different trade-off that they're willing to make, but those things are sort of embedded in that. And so we sort of took that idea of like, okay, that's some economic value that people associate with their lives. And certainly under enslavement, there was a lot of discussion of amongst enslaved people after they were freed of sort of the costs that they were incurring and sort of desire to escape toward freedom, but the various impediments to escaping toward freedom that a lot of people were willing to endure worse than death uh, to try to keep their family safe and, and their, their, their partner, their kids, their, their extended family. Uh, and so there's, a, there's been a characterization of slavery as social death, that in a sense it's just the taking of people's agency, the taking of their lives. And, and here we're drawing on, probably on somewhat more of a humanities tradition as well uh, of thinking about these different embedded costs of enslavement. So how do you use that idea, that idea of social death in your research? If we think about, okay, say this value of statistical life is often, you know, 100 to 200 times annual consumption, take that same $40 of annual consumption, or say, say take the $40 of annual consumption that a free person would be earning at that time in the agricultural sector, multiply that by, say, 150 to get an implied value of statistical life, on an annualized basis, that generates a cost of around $420 uh, at a 7% interest rate. And that $420, you could think about, is like, okay, well, that's the annual cost that, that people were really incurring. Not the $100 gang labor premium or something a little bit more when you're adding that value of time, the sort of $420 reflecting that loss of agency over their lives. And that $420 relative to the $60 that was being produced is now a more substantial $360 per enslaved person. And take that $360 and multiply it by the 4 million enslaved people, 13% of the U.S. population at that time, you're going to get a very large number relative to, to GDP. And that's where the 35% comes from. So just, think, just explain to us, what do those numbers really mean? What would it mean to say that emancipation boosted the economy by the equivalent of 35% of GDP? These calculations aren't so much that this is an exact number that, that you would take, but more of a conceptual shift in just the overall economic performance of enslavement and, and emancipation. And what emancipation really fundamentally did was just launch forward the aggregate U.S. economy and bring about these just tremendous gains um, that, that haven't been fully appreciated. And so the end of slavery and, eman and emancipation is not this sort of period of economic loss. It's this tremendous leap forward that then creates opportunities for further advancement with further with with declines in racial discrimination with declines in, in racial harassment there's further gains as well because a corollary to a lot of these ideas is just the inefficiency of say for example racial or sexual harassment as well that it's true that some people might have a preference for being uh, racially discriminatory or some people might have a preference for sexual harassment uh, for inflicting sexual harassment. But in general, the costs that are incurred by people that are harassed or discriminated against are much larger than the gains to the person doing the harassment. 
And so it's also similarly just this incredibly inefficient activity that maybe it's generating some gains for somebody, but it's, it's imposing such larger costs on others. And so that's the sense in which it's not just about comparing some people's welfare to other people's welfare, it's also just on this direct trade-off, an incredibly inefficient way of taking something from somebody, that, you're, you're, that, that so much is being lost along the way. And this notion of efficiency or what's efficient or inefficient, it's not synonymous with what's moral or correct or what should be done. It, uh, economists are, are sometimes odd people. And you know, when economists say something's efficient, they don't necessarily mean that thing should be done. It's just a way of describing some aspect of its characteristic. Um, but we can think about something as being efficient or inefficient. Rick Hornbeck, thank you so much for coming in and talking to us about your work. That's it for my interview with Rick Hornbeck. You can find a lot more about the economics of slavery and its legacy on Chicago Booth Review's website at chicagobooth.edu slash review. When you're there, sign up for our weekly newsletter so you never miss the latest in business-focused academic research. This episode was produced by Josh Stunkel. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and please do leave us a five-star review. Until next time, I'm Hal Weitzman. Thanks for listening to the Chicago Booth Review podcast.